simple truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Hayes. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. It is Catholic Family Men Monday, where we primarily direct the content to men, most especially to those of us who are called to the vocation of marriage and family in order to build up husbands and fathers in Christ, to bless the family and sanctify the world. But make no mistake, everyone is certainly most welcome to listen in and or watch. Plenty here that is valuable and applicable to all, especially with regard to our topic today. You are in for a treat. It is of special value, certainly, uh, to husbands and fathers, to, to mothers and wives, to parents who are raising families. Also, certainly today, uh, to priests and to bishops, to leaders, all across the board, whatever your vocation may be, to understand uh, what has gone on in the history of the church in the United States over the past many decades. And this topic today really gets into much of that history, uh, specifically related to communism and moral relativism. We're going to get into all of this today. Our topic is The Devil and Bella Dodd. It's a new book, and it's entitled precisely that, The Devil and Bella Dodd, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption. It's authored by Dr. Mary Nicholas and Dr. Paul Kengor. It's published by Tan. Tanbooks.com is where you can find it. Uh, it's fre fresh, brand new here from Tan Books, tanbooks.com. Uh, but we are blessed to have Dr. Mary Nicholas with us. She is a retired physician and research librarian. She was active in the university faculty for life. She has contributed articles to both the American Thinker and Canada Free Press and now author of The Devil and Bella Dodd. Dr. Mary Nicholas, thank you for being with us today. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, it's a great blessing to have you with us. So uh, if we can begin with the, the personal story, just share a little on your background. Um, what drew your interest to Bella Dodd? Well, um, my mother was very active in fighting against communism. This was in the 50s, the era of McCarthy. And she had a relative who was sort of working with her. They were both interested in finding getting to the bottom of what this communist conspiracy was. So I was um, all ears. Aunt Elisa would come out and talk to my mother. She would go actually go to the communist meetings in New York City. And then she'd come back and report to my mother. And of course, I was all ears. And I remember one day she came back and she said, my mother was a recent convert to Catholicism. And she said, Barbara, they have infiltrated every single church and don't think they won't infiltrate yours. And that was never erased from my memory. And um, so I had this in the back of my mind as I saw politics developing in this country and in the church. And finally, about, I would say, maybe 20 years ago, I was living in Connecticut and I think God was waking me up and uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing in terms of the um, sermons that the priests were giving. And so I decided to make an experiment and every Sunday I would go to a different church. I had earplugs and I would give the priest maybe three minutes to speak and I would just put the earplugs in because I figured I do not want to be exposed to heresy. And it was pathetic because I knew better. I had a very good background in catechetics, um, but for the ordinary Catholic listening to this, they wouldn't have known what was true and what was not true. It was really, I was like, it was like a sword through my heart because I just couldn't believe it. So um, I decided to go back, you know, retrace my steps as it were, and investigate communism and it's um, what it had done to the church. And um, during this time, 
luckily I met, I shouldn't say luckily, but providentially, I met Alice von Hildebrand. Hmm. And she was a saintly woman who had a wonderful background in philosophy and theology as did her husband Dietrich von Wildebrand. They knew what was going on. They were good friends with Bella Dodd. And I found out that she didn't live too far from me. So I was making all sorts of contacts, calls, letters, everything, trying to get in touch with someone who knew what was going on in the church. And I finally wrote to Alice and I said, can you help me out, you know? And she said, oh, please come up and see me. So I told her I wanted to write a book about Bella and she was actually at that point, one of the few people who had a personal relationship with Bella. And um, she said, do come up, do come up. So she uh, and I had maybe three or four interviews and she remembered everything as clear as a bell, everything that Bella had told her. So I remember this one story in particular. Um, it was after Vatican II and um, Dietrich said to Bella Dodd, who was high up in the Communist Party at that time, he said to her, Bella, I think something happened after Vatican II. There's something going on in the church. And Bella answered, you think? I know. I personally put over a thousand men into seminaries to infiltrate the church. Mm -hmm. And each time she would tell me the story, it would not move one inch one way or the other. She repeated it verbatim. And um, it was a clear confirmation for me that something drastic had happened and, you know, needed to be addressed. You cannot solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And so it was very clear that um, Bella knew, that Alice knew, and that this had to get out. So that was sort of how I began in earnest doing more research on the Communist Party and its relationship with the Catholic Church. All right, Dr. Mary Nicholas is with us. She is author of The Devil and Bella Dodd, co-author with Dr. Paul Kengor. You can get it from Tan Books, tanbooks.com. Brand new title and uh, very blessed to have Dr. Nicholas here with us to discuss it. So. Yeah, very interesting um, history to recount there. And so it, it really does beg the question. I mean, to my understanding, Dr. Nicholas, you have done more research on this question on Bella Dodd and on the possible communist infiltration of the Catholic Church than anybody else. At the end of that research, when you look at all the evidence, what is your conclusion? Is that testimony from Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, um, is that something that you would say the evidence, it's not just one piece of testimony from Dr. Von Hildebrand, but that there are other corroborating pieces of evidence that do point to uh, the fact or perhaps the likelihood that um, that this actually was the case, that more than a thousand uh, communists were infiltrated uh, into the Catholic priesthood. Well, I think the answer is from a statement by Bishop Schneider just recently. Mm -hmm. And he said, the church is in ruins. He's not someone to exaggerate or, you know, elaborate. He, he just made that statement. And I think even though there are pockets of wonderful Catholics and some outstanding, really heroic priests, I think there's no getting away from the reality that the church is in desperate straits. And one of the reasons it's in this shape is from the communist infiltration. It's not the only one. We don't mention, for instance, the infiltration of the Masons, but it's certainly communism where, where they had to have gone right into seminaries and poisoned them 
with this rot um, is one of the clear answers. Mm -hmm. Yes, again, Dr. Mary Nicholas with us. The Devil and Baladad is the title of the book. You can get it from Tan Books, tanbooks.com. And I want to open up the phone lines now. If you have a question or a comment you'd like to call in with today, one 511 5483 That's one 511 5483 Only about a minute and a half until the break. But Dr. Nicholas, when you look at it and you think about um, one of the things that always strikes me when, when, as I've kind of looked at this question a little bit, and I have done it a lot more since um, since noticing your book, and then I've gone back and read School of Darkness, the autobiography by Bella. Dodd. But one of the um, the interesting things is I'm not I'm not sure I, I haven't gathered as much evidence as you. I'm hoping in a good reading of the book that you've put forth to get a better sense of whether it happened or it didn't happen or to what degree was this infiltration of the Catholic Church did it take place? But one of the things that strikes me is. Um, just I think what you're alluding to, which is if you just look at the bad fruits that we're living in now, it would make sense. It, it would it would put a lot of the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so just on that level, it certainly seems very plausible, if not likely, based on the pieces of evidence that are out there. And we're going to get into more of that evidence that is out there, particularly a Monsignor Fulton Sheen that met with uh, Bella Dodd and, um, and helped her to come back into the Catholic Church, actually did a conditional baptism uh, for her and, and catechized her and brought her back. Really beautiful story, but, uh, but Monsignor, then Monsignor Fulton Sheen, um, he also um, was involved in, in perhaps some of this testimony with Bella Dodd and the infiltration of the Catholic Church. We'll get into that some when we get back and much more. Stay tuned. Howdy. This is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. We strive to keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and a look at the breaking news of the day that you need to know. Join us on the Catholic Drive Time Show every weekday morning at 7 a.m. across the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. That's every weekday morning at 7 a.m. I look forward to seeing you there. God love you. Love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. The Station of the Cross is listener-funded, and we value your ongoing generosity. In this fast-paced world, it's easy to let your recurring donation slip due to something like a new address or a card number change. If you suspect that we might not have your up-to-date donor information, you can check with us during regular business hours at 1-877-888-6279, extension 104, or anytime online at thestationofthecross.com. We are helping to bring the Catholic community together through our Catholic Community Events page. You can discover the details about a community calendar event that you've heard on the air. Just click on the events tab at thestationofthecross.com and find your local station. If your parish or Catholic organization has an upcoming event and you'd like to get the word out, you can submit it for consideration under the events tab as well at thestationofthecross.com. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Dr. Mary Nicholas. She is author of The Devil and Bella Dodd, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption, co-authored by Dr. Paul Kengor, published by Tan. You can get it at tanbooks.com. And also want to recommend the autobiography of Bella Dodd's School of Darkness as well. Um, I just finished reading this for the first time. And um, just an absolutely incredible um, autobiography. So much to learn about the history of what took place with respect to communism, with respect to the United States, as well as the, the story of Bella Dodd and the way that she tells it. Um, a very intelligent, educated woman 
Um, and, and I think you will enjoy her writing, especially the big payoff which delivers in the final two chapters of this book. If you stick with it, School of Darkness, you're going to learn a lot about the communist tactics, but you're also going to learn um, a lot about uh, just the beauty of conversion to Jesus and to his Catholic Church and, and just uh, the grace uh, that is so um, just, we're, we're just so blessed. We are so blessed. And you see it alive in this life of Bella Dodd as she returns to Jesus and the Catholic faith with the help of Monsignor Fulton Sheen. And so this new book, The Devil and Bella Dodd, it brings together a, a lot that's in the School of Darkness, but then it is masterful in the way that Dr. Nicholas and Dr. Ken Gore, they have just put all sorts of um, information all around it to draw out so much more. So um, there's just a lot in this book that is so good. The Devil and Bella Dodd, you can get it at tanbooks.com. And it reads as follows with respect to this one aspect of Bella Dodd and, um, and Bishop Sheen, now Venerable uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. It says this, that Bella Dodd's reported comments about her role in helping to infiltrate the Catholic Church in America with over a, a thousand communist men can be found all over the internet. And again, much if not most of the writing is scanned in reliable documentation. It is frankly a mess. Here in this book, we have taken particular care to report what Bella both did say and did not say. Our primary interest in pursuing her FBI file was precisely in search of documentation for information regarding that alleged infiltration. We have been sorry to see, at least so far, that confirming information in her FBI file still has not been released. That is not a surprise of all the infiltration and deception that Belladot dealt with in her infiltration with the devil of communism. This was the most pernicious. It remains the most sensitive. As we, as we shall share, her confessor, Fulton Sheen, advised her to be extremely careful, if not to the point of silence, regarding the details of this infiltration. We were told that Sheen told Belladad not to share names of any corrupted clergy. So, Dr. Nicholas, I'd like to ask you about this. This puzzles me. I first heard about this when I watched your interview with... Um, uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Robach Morris of, of the Ruth Institute, a, a great interview, and um, and in that this this comes up, and I was a bit surprised by it. I would be surprised why um, why Monsignor Fulton Sheen, then Monsignor Fulton Sheen, would want this to to be so secretive. If there were a thousand men, communist men, who had, in, had infiltrated the Catholic Church and were in the priesthood, rising up the ranks. I would think that it would be very important to blow the whistle on that and to expose that and, the, and because souls are at stake and they're leading people astray. But I don't know, what's your take as you take it all in? It's a very difficult question. Um, we, we should add that in 1952, Bishop Sheen was in Paris and he gave a... Um, speech there about this precise thing and it was reported in the New York Times front page April 28 1952 and it, the headline was Sheen in Rome says red agents tried to infiltrate the priesthood I don't think he would say that unless he had a very very good reason and then the article goes on to say that the American communists were under secret orders in 1936 to infiltrate the Roman Catholic priesthood. The 57-year-old auxiliary bishop of New York spoke to what was described as an overflowing congregation in the American Catholic Church of Santa Susana. This was the beginning of the planting of forces of evil communism within the religious communities to destroy them from within. He said, a call for volunteers to enter religious orders and make the great sacrifices of the life of a seminarian was made at a secret red meeting in a large American city. I mean, that pretty much tells you what he believed and what was going on, why he didn't want it to be exposed, I think is difficult to answer. I think for one thing, the idea of whistleblowers and that whole culture was not the same back then. And second of all, he would not want 
he would not be able to reveal anything that Bella had told him in confession, right? Mm -hmm. So what else are we left with but that he made a prudential decision that this should not come out? Not that it shouldn't come out. He did it in in, uh, Rome, but that names were not to be named. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good good thoughts. Dr. Mary Nicholas is with us, author of The Devil and Baladad, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption, co-authored by Dr. Paul Kengor, published by Tan, tanbooks.com, tanbooks.com. You can also call in with any question or comment today for Dr. Nicholas, one 877 That's one 877 In this book, you have an entire chapter Uh, that is devoted to this topic, Bella and communists target and infiltrate the Catholic Church. We do have some, a lot of testimony, a lot of bits of evidence that that all kind of fit together in this chapter. Uh, It's a very illuminating chapter. Here's one little bit to kind of help people to understand um, how communist infiltration worked in general. And, And again, this was certainly, this is certainly documented to have gone on within uh, teachers unions, workers unions, um, even um, political parties and uh, in Congress. I mean, this was going on. The communists, uh, they, they were infiltrating institutions, starting front groups, doing all sorts of activity. All of that comes out uh, very strongly in School of Darkness. I'm sure it does as well in The Devil and Bella Dodd. It's important to understand all of this. So if it, again, it's it just a sort of logical conclusion, if they were infiltrating all these other areas, Areas, certainly they would have some effort to try to infiltrate the Catholic Church. And we do have strong evidence that the devil in Belladad, this book lays out regarding the infiltration of the Protestant communities. And, and here's one that goes along with that. Manning Johnson here explaining to Congress in July 1953 with uh, this testimony, quote, it is an axiom in communist organization strategy that if an infiltrated body has 1% Communist Party members and 9% Communist Party sympathizers with well-rehearsed plans of action, they can effectively control the remaining 90%. And particularly jarring, it goes on in the book to say, Johnson spoke to the infiltration of churches and seminaries in particular, quote, in the large sections of the religious field due to the ideological poison which has been filtered in by communists and pro-communists through seminaries, the backlog of sympathizers and mental prisoners of socialistic ideology is greater than the 10% necessary for effective control, end of quote. All it took, the book concludes here, is uh, was merely 1% Communist Party members and 9% sympathizers. A trusting flock could, in the hands of a few deceitful shepherds, be led into spiritual harm. It was that sort of especially insidious infiltration that Belladad looked to next and uh, goes on here with a section about seminaries as the neck of a funnel. You know, anybody who's been around faithful priests who have gone through seminaries in the past you know, 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years, they they have stories to tell, uh, oftentimes horrible stories about their experiences within Catholic seminaries, and they just had to try to keep their head down and, and get through many, many good men being weeded out if they seem to be too faithful. Um, so w- what is your um, comment here, Dr. Nicholas, on how the communists may have affected the seminaries in general, and if um, all this anecdotal evidence that people would know of based on folks that they've talked to that have been in these seminaries that would seem to line up, um, any hard piece of evidence that we have about the the seminaries being infiltrated in this way? Well, um, there was a wonderful um, researcher in Congress, J.B. Matthews, who's written a lot, and um, he wrote in the 40s and 50s, he um, wrote about the communists in the Protestant seminaries quite a bit. And um, they even had someone they called the, the Red Dean. Um, the, these, the, they spread them out throughout all the Protestant seminaries. And then what I'm thinking is, what do you do with ecumenism? If all these Protestants have wittingly or unwittingly become communists, then all we have to do mix a little 
ecumenism with that and it gets out to the Catholics. So it's there. They've got a couple of different ways of operating, but um, in terms of the hard evidence, I think we have that comment from Venerable Sheen in in um, Rome when he talked about it, and the hard evidence from Alice von Hildebrand. Mm -hmm. And um, there were several people who were at a um, talk by Bella Dodd in California. She spoke to, I believe, 800 people. And we have uh, the testimony from someone who was there. And since the book was um, started, we found another witness who who testifies to the fact that Bella Dodd said this, that she had put over a thousand people into Catholic seminaries. So I think you have enough with what we know, with how their tactics are in general, that um, it, it's, it's a reasonable conclusion. I think one reason, and I just heard this this weekend from a friend people don't want to believe that this happened people don't want to believe there's evil and so this person said to me oh i'm so glad this happened but my husband doesn't want to hear anything about this well we got we have to take the blinders off we can't just walk around in circles because unless you face the enemy straight on we're not going to do anything about this problem yes absolutely yeah and that's why we're doing this show today specifically i think who we are reaching today are many pa parents maybe even grandparents and, and to understand what has gone on where we are and if we can get a clear picture of that, then we can begin to understand how to properly navigate it well. There are so many folks who want to live a faithful life, who, who want to say yes to Jesus and his Catholic Church, but they, they've gotten a lot of deception even from their home parish, sadly, which has guided them to maybe put their children into schools where they're being indoctrinated with errors and being um, basically, um, you know, taken taken away from the faith in many ways even given a sort of a, um, a sense that this faith is just not even real at all but um, with, a, with, with a million different cuts you know so there's a lot here we're going to get into a lot more when we get back but we do need to dive into this we do need to face it this book the devil and bella dodd helps you to do it tanbooks.com we'll be right back this is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. America has never seen so many abortion ads. The Democrat Party is making partisan control of Congress and governor's races a partisan issue by its unified cry for unlimited and state-funded abortion. If Democrats lose, it will be a massive rejection of abortion. From the top of the party, the president again supports his abortion embrace, this time saying that no one knows precisely when human life begins. Outside the fictitious halls of the abortion industry, that statement is an utter falsehood. Beginning in 1839 and then even more in the last quarter century, science has gone one way. The moment a zygote forms... It is human. To depart from that requires a passive or malignant embrace of eugenics. That eugenics says some people deserve so much not to live that they may be denied their humanity. From actor Anne Hathaway calling abortion an act of mercy to pastor and senator Raphael Warnock endorsing the elimination of disabled children to candidates denying past support for unlimited abortion, it is a long list following the president's lead to election day. This is Life News Radio. In other stories, an 88-year-old pro-life witness is recovering from an attack outside a Napa, California, Planned Parenthood. After suffering a punctured lung and other serious injuries, his pro-life attorneys are now, a week later, trying to force prosecution of his assailant. A new FBI memo says Americans may expect pro-abortion violence from anarchists around the elections. And a story at Life News offers another in a series of short, powerful videos on abortion. It reproduces the real-life experience of a hospital ultrasound tech who says, I had no idea what I was walking into. This video offers passive advocates of abortion the same introduction.
For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Back to the Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Dr. Mary Nicholas. She is author of The Devil and Bella Dodd. You can get it at tanbooks.com. Talking about this today, specifically with respect to what chapter 13 outlines in this book about the infiltration of the Catholic Church, of the priesthood of the Catholic Church. So what we're saying here is, look, the doctrine of the Catholic Church rock solid. This is the church instituted by Jesus. Let there be no doubt this is the one true church. And yet there are human beings as members of this church with free will. And so, yes, people can get in with nefarious ideas or errors or heresies or to just outright infiltrate the church with uh, as communists or as freemasons or as whatever they want to bring in this can happen sure it can happen and so this is the claim that uh, was made by bella dodd her testimony to dr alice von hildebrand which she then has released before the end of her life in the years towards the end of her life you know i was blessed enough to, to interview dr von hildebrand probably about 15 years ago or so and um, this was not even on my radar at the time but would have loved to talk to her about it i know michael voris has a great interview out there with dr alice von Hildebrand where this comes up, uh, which is a, an important piece of evidence here. want to get into one more piece of evidence before we really drill down to how to navigate where we are today based on looking at this information and what it means to us. And so let's look at this piece of evidence. I think this is very important. And this is the, called the policy of the outstretched hand. And this is something we know is absolutely true. This was um, a term used to appeal to Roman Catholics that the, the communist did. This was a, a plan the communists put into play, the policy of the outstretched hand. It was, a, you refer to it in the book as it, it was an olive branch in one hand and a dagger in the other. Dr. Nicholas, what can you share with us about this policy, this communist policy of the outstretched hand? Well, I think at a certain point, the Communist Party realized they were not making the gains among Catholics and others that they had hoped through <laughs> starvation and everything else. And uh, so they said, all right, we're going to, um, we're going to mend our ways. We're going to have this policy of the outstretched hand. We're gonna reach out to you. We'll admit that we made mistakes in the past and going forward, this is how we'll operate. Um, the Pope in Rome knew they were much more clever than later days, I think. Um, they knew this was a hoax and they warned the people not to buy into it and whatever. But um, this policy went throughout the world, including Australia. And um, I think it gets back to, again, people don't want to believe in evil don't people don't want to believe that somebody would be this evil and deliberately try to uh destroy the catholic church so you can close your eyes and ears and that takes care of that problem but if you look at all the evidence including what is the latest thing um that happened was it this week the um this week, the ma the priest, or the priest in quotes, dancing and um, you know sacrilegiously hmm. to the host. Hmm. Who knows if it was a valid consecration? But that didn't come from nowhere. That's been going on for a while. And in addition to that, um, getting back to our particular problem. Um, the the um, Jesuit magazine America had an article just uh, two years ago, I believe, saying the Catholic. It was entitled "The Catholic Case for Communism." I mean, anybody who knows anything knows that's absolutely absurd. But um, 
not only did he get away with it, um, but the editor of the magazine backed him up and said, yes, that's, that's, that's a good that's a good policy so um it's no human being can solve the problems we have in the catholic church no matter what they do this has got to be solved by a lord himself mm-hmm. and um i think that's where we are it, if if this book could do one thing And that is open people's eyes to the possibility of this evil. It will have done a lot. Um, And again, part of it is people don't want to believe evil. Right. Right. And and that is the, the blessing of this book to to raise it, raise this forward for folks and, and say, look, are, do you want to face reality on this? Uh, we put a lot of work into compiling all of this evidence, all of these resources um, that, that we put all the, the, the work into. And here it is. Do you want to read it? Do you want to know? And for me, it's 100 percent. Absolutely. Yes. I would encourage that to be the answer for others as well. Again, the book is called The Devil and Belladad, published by Tan Books. You can get it at tanbooks.com, tanbooks.com. In fact, I'm not even sure if if it's available for release exactly quite yet. I know it comes out for sure this month. Um, Dr. Nicholas, do you know if folks go to tanbooks.com right now, if they, is it still in like a pre-order mode? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's until the 17th. Officially it's November 17th. Excellent. So tanbooks.com, tanbooks.com. And for folks that are confused perhaps about the church's teaching on communism, uh, you, you put these quotes in the book from Pope Pius XI. This is quite clear. This is what he said at the time in the 30s and in the 40s. He said, quote, it is unfortunately true that even today there exists a common enemy threatening everything all over the world, even the sanctuary of the family, the state and society. That enemy is communism, which is trying to penetrate everywhere and alas has already penetrated so many places by violence, by plot and by deceit, by going so far as to clothe its appearances with the best intentions. Uh, He also commented on how communism was more menacing when, quote, as has been the case most recently, it adopts less violent attitudes and less profane appearances, end of quote. And that is the truth, right? That it was that that was one of the the tactics of the communists is that they knew how to how to sell it. They knew how to package things in a way to deceive people. And not only that, but um, they're they're very um, very very quick and clever with regard to names and labels in order to deceive people. And so one of those tricks is that, look, you, you never know what name this evil is going to pop up under. Sometimes it can be quite clear and called communism, other times progressivism, sometimes socialism, democratic socialism, uh, the class struggle, we're just for the little guy, th- all kinds of areas that this evil pops up under. And to me, when you, when, you, when you rip it all back to say, what are we really looking at here? To me, we're looking at at two things very, very clearly, two evils that we have to understand and look them square in the eye and see where they are trying to deceive us and our families. And we have to come firmly against them and advance the opposite truth in these areas. And one of these areas is moral relativism. So this belief that there's no such thing as moral absolutes, we can just craft our own morality to be whatever we want it to be. We can decide whatever we want is good and evil. Um, And if we believe that kind of a lie, right, if that lie is being inserted or um, different moral absolutes are being downplayed or de-emphasized or not spoken of, uh, what goes along with this is that there can also be no God, right? There there can be no divinely revealed truth, certainly, if you don't believe in absolute truth, and, and not even any natural moral truth so no natural sense of right and wrong written on our hearts it's going it's cutting against all of that so what we're really talking about here is the a view of of the human person a view of the world as this atheistic humanism which really is more than just atheistic to take God out of the center of man and say, God is not the center, man is the center. It's actually satanic. This is what we see at the very beginning 
of creation with the angels, non servium, I will not serve the battle cry of Lucifer himself. And so Bella Dodd said in one of her interviews, quote, this whole question of morality, the question of humanism, as far as man is concerned and what he is, man is God, she said. That's the whole approach of the Soviet system. And it's the approach that we're beginning to adopt. The the God is dead movement is by no means a college prank. It's a well-considered cutting of the underpinnings of our civilization End of quote. We see this run amok at scale in our time. Marxism is another way to say it. We we have seen this. We've seen the fruits of this, the bad, evil fruits of this, and we're living through it. If we can't see through this now, how are we ever going to see through when they're trying to tell us that a man is not a man, a woman is not a woman, we're all the same, redefining marriage, redefining the child in the womb, do whatever you want, let's murder innocent human beings by the thousands every day. All of this is evil, and, and we've got to see through it, and, and we've got to um, get back to absolute moral truth. We've got to get back to putting God at the center, um, Jesus at the center, And so this really, to me, is what it all comes down to. As you see it, Dr. Nicholas, as you survey it all, um, how how do you, what do you look at at the core of all of this? I agree. I think it's um, a total defamation of God. Atheism is not leave God alone, don't do anything. Atheism hates God. They hate God. And we're seeing this in our civilization now and i believe it's i hate to be a pessimist but i i believe it's going to get worse um if you can kill seven million ukrainians by starvation including children and have it reported, I think, in only two or three newspapers in the United States, and not a word said about it, I I think you can do an awful lot. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, tell tell us more, I guess, about that since you raise it, and I gotta be honest, I'm not in in the know on this. Tell us more about what you know about the starvation in Ukraine. Uh, The Ukrainian starvation took place not long after, um, not long after Stalin was in in, um, office, office in quotes. And um, he was trying to consolidate his power. And he said at one point, you know, we may lose the Ukraine. Now, remember that the Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. Hmm. It wasn't just any little country. It was the breadbasket for the whole of Europe. And um, so he decided that he would let them starve. The best explanation for it is, I think you were going to, somebody was going to put it in the show notes, the, the movie, The Soviet Story. And um, the, I don't know how this man compiled all this information, but it shows the Russian troops galloping into these Ukrainian towns and just leveling them. And the people actually on the streets literally starving in front of your eyes. And if someone would go out like to the field just to grab a a couple of seeds to eat anything they would just shoot them so in 1932 approximately 7 million Ukrainians died from this starvation it was totally deliberate yeah yeah you look a a lot of this a lot of this history that we have lost that we need We need to learn it. We need to learn it. Look, I'm a product of public school education, sadly growing up uh, from kindergarten, really nursery school, probably all the way through high school, um, and then some into the the university system until I had a big conversion. I mean, the the indoctrination that that I experienced and and I can, I, I know 
so much of what um, what I've lost when I'm going back and trying to learn it now and saying, why were we never taught this? Why was the truth never taught here? This infiltration of the teachers, of the schools, of the churches, it explains so much. So many of us ask, why do our, pre our priests never speak the truth about this issue or that issue? Um, some of this is a trickle down effect. We'll get into that when we get back, stay tuned. Keep up to date with the shows we bring you each day on the Station of the Cross by viewing our programming grid on our website, thestationofthecross.com, and on our iCatholic Radio app. Just click the menu icon in the top left portion of our app and select the link to our programming grid. That's at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I discovered the Station of the Cross rather providentially a year ago. I've been a loyal listener ever since. I can't overestimate the value of the station when it's made a difference in my life in terms of making me better informed Catholic. It has enriched my faith and told me during tough times. It made me laugh on several occasions. I commend the important work of this great apostolate. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I listen to the radio. And if I can listen to something that brings me closer to God, closer to Jesus Christ, then it's the most beautiful thing. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Dr. Mary Nichols. She is a, I'm sorry, Dr. Mary Nicholas. She is a co-author of The Devil and Bella Dodd with Dr. Paul Kengor. It is published by Tan, tanbooks.com. This is an extremely important book to get your hands on. Again, The Devil and Bella Dodd, tanbooks.com. Dr. Nicholas, let me ask you this. This is uh, something that I ponder as I think about this communist infiltration of um, of our institutions, but particularly of our Catholic Church. I mean, you, you outline here in chapter 13 of the book, not only um, not only infiltration of the Catholic seminaries, but infiltration of Catholic lay organizations, establishment of front groups, Catholic Committee for Human Rights, infiltration of churches, seminaries, youth groups, and more. Um, and uh, and there's a there's a lot here with respect to this to what the communists were able to accomplish in this in these infiltrations and so look if this took place in the 20s 30s 40s 50s and this was going on and let's say that this claim is true that Bella Dodd actually personally saw to it that over a thousand men, 1,100 men, whatever it would be, entered the seminaries as an infiltration, a communist infiltration of the Catholic seminaries, and then they made their way up the hierarchy the best that they could. Um, what would be the ramifications now? So if they did this, then they would they would be using all sorts of deception to influence people, which um, would be very effective. And then at a certain point, though, you would get generationally down the road where I would think, so we wouldn't have people that would be necessarily communist infiltrators anymore, but you'd be, you would have people that had such poor formation or such um, a formation really in lies and errors 
that were specifically put in there to try to destroy faith and morals of people individually and then of the, the teaching so that the true teaching wouldn't be proclaimed, which is where we would find ourselves today. And it seems to be where we do find ourselves today. If you just, I just was talking to a woman just yesterday who told me um, it was she heard one time in her entire adult life, her entire life, that um, th- that her priest preached anything about abortion, that she ever heard a priest talk about abortion from the pulpit. Um, and so you he- you hear these stories. We all have different experiences that would line up with this. What is your take? How how should we look at it now based on the sort of trickle down influence of this infiltration? I think that each uh, individual person is responsible for educating him or herself. And I think you have to go back to old documents of the church, to the catechism of the Catholic Church, and pray to the Holy Spirit to enlighten you because you're not, as I said, when I was in Connecticut, um, and there were a few exceptions that were wonderful, but you're not going to get this from the ordinary parish today, unfortunately, because they have not been formed uh, or they've been formed incorrectly. Um, part of the tactics of propaganda is telling lies and um, trying to trip you up, but part of it is withholding the truth. So all they had to do was withhold the truth for let's say 75 years and here we are. And also I'll point out that some of these men who infiltrated the church, where would they be for uh, at the time of Vatican II? I'll tell you where they were. I think some of them were there. And we know for a fact some communists were there because the Russian Orthodox Church was there. So that taints Vatican II with communism, whether we, no matter what you want to call it, but that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I remember one um, pastor in particular who I worked for as a a youth minister for a time who described himself as progressive. At the time, I didn't really understand exactly what that was referring to. And then he also, um, he said, well, no, we haven't changed any of the church's teachings, um, but we have since, but Vatican II changed the emphasis. We changed the emphasis. And what does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, one thing that is very clear what it means is we've decided to not proclaim the moral truth anymore. We've decided, yes, we have it in doctrine, but in practice, what I tell people in the confessional, what I'm preaching at the pulpit, you know, I'm, I'm basically telling people, you know, don't worry about it. You know, we're not holding right. this anymore. And that is a right. lie. We are holding it. It is the truth of faith and morals that the, the magisterium of the Catholic Church exists to serve and to proclaim for our good. This is for us. People deserve to hear the truth proclaimed. And it's the church, it's the, the priests and the bishops in the church who are in those offices that they need to be faithful to fulfilling those offices and proclaiming the truth. So look, we've got to be honest that we haven't really been given that at this point in human history where we are today. And as you're saying, we've got to go back to, uh, as, as uh, G.K. Chesterton says, the democracy of the dead when talking about tradition and saying, um, let's go to some other bishops. Uh, we just had St. Charles Borromeo's feast day the other day. Let's go read some of his writings. What are some of the bishops of old saying about faith and morals? It still holds true. We need to hear that again today. What other advice do you have for us? Well, I think as I said, each person is responsible for educating him or herself. But I think also maybe just starting out on this journey, people have to thank God for their faith and be on their knees for what they do have. And just keep pursuing it. You will come to the truth. It may not happen in a year or it may not happen in two years, but if you pursue this, you will find the truth of Christ's church 
He, he will give that to you. He will give it to you. And that's the and that's the beautiful conclusion in the life of Beladad, isn't it? It really is a conclusion of the gift of God's grace that he was constantly holding there before her. And she finally um, she finally turned back. She finally said yes. And um, the fruits of, of a life with God versus a life in the darkness of communism, moral relativism, atheism. Um, I mean, it's, it's night and day. People don't realize what they're missing. The, the story of Beladad really draws that out as a stark distinction. What more can you tell us about uh, the, 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 what you see in the life of Beladad? Well, I think Beladad is a miracle. It's a miracle that she changed. It's, <laughs> it's a miracle that she met venerable sheen in fact the story of that is that they had family friends in the bronx the mcgraths and they didn't see each other often she was by now you know almost in a hopeless situation they were persecuting her she was followed by the kgb she was followed by the fbi and she was down in washington dc which is a pretty big city and she's walking down the street and by this time, a few newspapers and things had come out about what she was going through. And who comes up to her but this McGrath, Mr. McGrath, who was her old childhood friend. And he said, Bella, you look terrible. Is there anything I can do? Do you, do you want to get protection? She said, no, I don't want protection. I have FBI, I have KGB. He said, well, if not, would you see a priest? And she said, yes. And of course he took her to Bishop Sheen, which is, I mean, that's another miracle right there. What are the chances of finding that on the streets of Washington, DC? Yeah, absolutely amazing. Then Monsignor Fulton Sheen, I, I, I mean, just being able to receive catechesis straight from uh, Bishop Sheen himself, which actually we all have the opportunity to do. All of his teachings are out there. So many of his preaching, so much of his preaching is out there. A catechism series by Bishop Sheen, highly influential for me in my early years coming back to the faith. Um, so again, go and learn I your think, faith. Excuse me, I think Tan is going to republish all of his books. Yes, they're doing that. Yes, we're going to have an update on that soon. But this book, The Devil and Belladad, tanbooks.com. Thank you, Dr. Mary Nicholas. Come to the St. Thomas More House of Prayer and discover the prayer that will change your life. The St. Thomas 